Hey everybody, welcome back to The Historian's Craft. So, um, past videos of mine have really tended to focus on society on either side of the Rhine Danube frontier in late antiquity. So, with that in mind, what I want to do in this one is try to bring that together, or at least, you know, kind of start to. Um, but in order to really do that, there are some problems we need to tackle. Some deal with sources, some deal with how we conceptualize barbarians and Romans. Um, not everything will be dealt with in this video, but like I said, this is going to start. So the biggest issue we really need to consider in this whole thing um, is a process rather than an event. This thing that we call the barbarian invasions. So the older, more, you know, traditional quote-unquote way of looking at this is that at some point in the late 200s, early 300s, um, these people called the Huns start showing up in what is basically like, you know, European Russia. Um, and then by the 360s, 370s, they attack the Goths, or at least a portion of the Goths, and the Goths move. And this turns into a billiard ball type of scenario where one group moves into the territory of another group of, you know, barbarian peoples, etc. And eventually groups of barbarian peoples cross that frontier, the Rhine Danube zone, um, and they move into the Roman Empire. There is, however, another viewpoint. Um, and it's partially the view that we'll be taking in this video and other videos which deal broadly with the topic that's under discussion here, which is the uh, Roman frontier zone. And it largely comes from the perspective of a prominent medievalist named Guy Housel, or at least he's the main proponent of it, if not the originator of the whole idea, okay? And that alternate view is that the end of the Roman Empire in the West caused the barbarian invasions, not the other way around. So to deal with this viewpoint there, we need to factor in a couple different things. Uh, military history, political history, and the relationship of the barbarians and the Romans with one another the relationship they had over the frontier zone, which bleeds into this other thing which we'll be talking about later um, called border history. So, during the crisis of the 3rd century, the Roman Empire's frontiers shrink slightly, and in other areas, they become fortified. In the 250s and the 260s, Roman sources tell us, okay, that the state abandoned what are known to us today as um, tithe lands, agri decimate in Latin. Now, this region, these tithe lands, they lie essentially between the Rhine and the Danube rivers, and while we don't necessarily know all that much about it, we do know that it was a frontier region. Now, this wasn't the only frontier region to be abandoned in the 3rd century. Okay, far from it. The Romans also leave Dacia, which Trajan's armies had fought so hard for, and they would draw from the region around um, Volubilis, modern Kassar Faroon, Morocco. And they do all of this in about 260, 270, 280. Um, and the regions are occupied by the Alemanni, the Sarmatians, the Goths, and North African tribes. Now, if you go north across the English Channel, the situation in Britain is somewhat similar, but it's really here that we start to see fortifications springing up. And I'm talking, of course, about the famous um, Saxon shore forts. Now, we often think of fortifications, no matter what they are, walls, castles, towers, as structures designed for defense. And that's very true. That is, in part, what they're designed for. But they also serve as focus points from which you can project power across a region. And that appears to have been, at least partially, the function of Hadrian's Wall. Politics and society in Britain, especially in the north, centered on that fortification, on Hadrian's Wall, with chieftains in what is today, you know, basically Scotland, uh, being buried with Tons of Roman goods, probably given to them in exchange for peace, maybe for local support. We don't really know. Now, the farther west you go, in what is today Wales, the less Romanized the province was. And this really is not all that surprising. Wales was never fully pacified by the Romans, so that's basically what we should expect to see. But in the late 3rd and then into the 4th century, along the Channel Coast, on both sides, so the continent and the British Isles, New forts were constructed. These were the Saxon shore forts, so named because, well, we're not actually sure. Uh, there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that the Saxons were raiding the coast from bases of what is today the North Sea coast of like Germany um, and the Netherlands. And we know that some Saxons were doing this. And the other possibility is that 
the Romans hired some Saxons as mercenaries to guard the coast and that some of them were garrisoned in these forts. Either way you look at it though, the northern frontier is being fortified. And the Rhine Delta was also part of this system of fortifications. Along the entire Delta and the entire lower Rhine region where it um, empties into the North Sea, a series of forts were either constructed or older forts were repaired. And what this did was, at least in theory, help protect the coast and the channel and ensure that Roman ships could travel in the region and deliver supplies as needed. And these also existed along the Danube, on the border between what is today basically like Serbia um, and Romania, within a gorge known as the Iron Gates. Okay, here the Emperor Constantine, he builds a wall. And he also built a bridge from Oskus to Sukidava, two settlements on either side of the Danube. So Roman armies in this area, they could protect it, and they could also move freely across the frontier. Now, the 300 also witnesses the construction of a new kind of fort along the Danube, the um, Quadrabergia. These tiny little fortlets, which take their names from being constructed in a square or some kind of a rectangle um, adorned with four towers at the corners. So these little tiny fortlets, they're less than a hectare in size, and they're designed with towers at each end of the fort. So what these do, okay, is they serve the dual function of keeping a close watch on the Goths and serving as mustering points for the Roman army if they ever have to campaign across the frontier in that area. And the fact that these were built on both sides of the Danube and most heavily concentrated on the lower portion of the river tells us that there probably was a new power in the region. And it just so happens that our sources really start to talk about a new group in this time period, the Goths. All right, so far we have been focusing on frontier zones and for good reason. Now, probably the best work on the Roman frontier in recent years, although it's getting a little old at this point, um, is Whitaker's Frontiers of the Roman Empire, published in 1994. So Whitaker's idea is interesting, and it's one that many historians have found, you know, incredibly convincing, myself included. So its basic argument, okay, is that Roman propaganda makes a lot out of the frontier zone. And on the one hand, you know, it's easy to do this and it makes a lot of sense. All of these forts, all of these, you know, geological boundaries like rivers, mountains, deserts, okay, they make for very clear lines, a very uh, clearly delineated boundary. If you're standing on one bank of the Rhine, for example, you know, it's easy to comprehend the river as a boundary between your place and, you know, whatever's on the other side, uh, the place that is not your state or country, it's something else, something other, barbarian. And Roman propaganda made great use of this physical divide. Those living within the Roman Empire, they were civilized, and those living outside of it were not. They were the barbarians, savages, um, and there were all kinds of different rhetoric about them. Over the past few decades, though, and this is where Whitaker's idea comes into play, um, academic history has been influenced by other fields like anthropology, sociology, etc., and what's called the cross-fertilization of the disciplines. So, essentially what that means is that if you're a historian and you do a PhD, um, which is basically like the driver's license for academic research, you're going to be trained not only in history, but in related disciplines because they have a huge impact on how you conduct research and on what questions you ask. Well, when you do that, um, you understand Whitaker's point in his book, which is, you know, although the frontier, quote-unquote, is a reality, on the other hand, it's also, like, not real. It's not a thing. We're conditioned in the modern day to think of borders as concrete. If you want to cross from, say, North Korea to South Korea, you're going to go through a very clearly defined zone. And they are. These aren't just arbitrary lines on a map. Borders have very clear political um, and economic consequences on both sides. The problem, though, is that if you take that thinking and you project backwards basically before, like, the French Revolution, before we really get into modern conceptions of what it means to be a nation, the maps you're going to be looking at are going to, at least to a degree, um, be lying to you. The frontiers are not just lines on a map. I mean, yes, on the one hand they are, but there's so much more than that. His argument, okay, is that we shouldn't think of these as frontiers as a concrete concept, rather as frontier zones. There were cultural, linguistic, political, economic, and social overlaps on both sides of these rivers, forts, mountains, and, you know, forests. It would not really be all that strange for you uh, to be a commander of, say, I don't know, a fort on the Rhine frontier and to have relations with the barbarian peoples right across the river. If you're running low on something like, I don't know, beef, 
Well, then usually there's a Roman town or something nearby, probably, but there are also those people across the frontier. So, if you need supplies, what do you do? Well, you trade with them. And it would not really have been all that strange to have some of these people serving as mercenaries in the Roman army, uh, maybe some of them garrison the fort, or maybe because the Romans and the barbarians interact with each other so often, maybe there's some marriage going on between the two. Maybe one of these mercenaries knows that his nephew is looking for work, so you know maybe that Germanic mercenary, maybe he goes to his Roman commander and he says, hey look, uh, some people in my family want to join up. My point is that this was a zone of multicultural interaction and lined on a map can really only tell you so much. And this actually forms the foundation for a relatively new field of history and historical research called border history, which focuses on the movement and uh, which focuses on the movements of peoples and goods and interactions of peoples in frontier zones. So for any of you watching this, um, who live in the southern United States, like near the Mexican border, you probably have some idea of this, right? Mexicans and Americans interact all the time across the border. It's not just a line on a map. There is very real interaction which goes on. So we see this especially in the period most often covered on this channel, late antiquity. So somewhat recently, okay, there's been a trend in a lot of the literature on the late Roman Empire, which argues that although these frontiers existed, it doesn't keep everyone out, and it really wasn't even supposed to. We have plenty of evidence of cross-cultural interaction over rivers and mountain ranges. And because it doesn't keep everyone out, the frontiers weren't all that important. Now, arguments like this have a very good point to make. Frontiers aren't always impenetrable. And very rarely do they solidify along, you know, ethnic or linguistic boundaries um, before the modern day. And it would have been very normal for a nobleman in 4th or 5th century Gaul, you know, near the frontier, to hire Franks as laborers or security. Peoples and goods cross those boundaries all the time. But saying they were unimportant probably overstates this. Frontiers and the political rhetoric spawning from them do hold a powerful grip on the psyche. And Guy Housel, for example, uses the Iron Curtain to make this point in his book, Barbarian Migration in the Roman West. People cross that frontier all the time, but it still existed in the minds of people in Germany and the Soviet Union and Britain and France and the USA. Probably the most interesting aspect of the Roman frontier in late antiquity, especially with something like, you know, popular history is concerned, which is, I guess, kind of what this channel is aimed at, um, would be military history, the military history of the frontier. So if you study this topic, you will. Not right away, maybe, but you will eventually um, encounter the work of this guy named Edward Lutvak. So he studies international relations, geopolitics, military history, military strategy, that kind of thing. The big, you know, flashy stuff. And in 1979, he publishes this book, The Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire. And in that book, he argues that in late antiquity, the Roman Empire basically ditched an earlier, you know, idea of frontier security, um, called preclusive security, and shifted their attention and efforts to a policy of defense in depth. So he looks at the function of the two main branches of the late Roman army, the Comitatensius and the um, Limitanei. And he concludes that the Limitanei, because they were frontier troops, would deal with raids and smaller incursions, harrying the enemy and keeping them occupied, while the Comitatensis, the field troops, were mustered. However, although that book was influential at the time, um, it's been realized based on further research that that thesis is probably wrong. What these units instead represent are two things. The idea of a heavily defended frontier, okay, it still stands. Um, the Romans don't necessarily appear to have done anything really different here in late antiquity, as evidenced by the construction of a massive amount of forts and other defensive positions along the frontiers in the 300s, which the Limitanei would have garrisoned, okay, and the field armies being stationed in the heart of the provinces, rather than the frontiers, okay, very likely, owing to the size of the military, this has to do more with um, actual logistics and the supplying of resources and an effort to control internal problems like banditry and provincial unrest. Now, when you're talking about the Roman Empire, eventually, you're going to have to deal with Virgil's epic, the Aeneid, 
because in that epic poem, he states that the gods have granted the Romans empire without end, although sometimes it's translated um, as empire without limit. Essentially, Roman propaganda takes this and it uses it to justify divine imperialism. So in late antiquity, as the Roman state converts to Christianity, that idea gets tweaked. And the new monotheistic empire attaches that divine imperialism to its new religion, Christianity. So the Roman Empire becomes central to God's plan for humanity. So although the barbarian lands were quote-unquote, you know, not Roman, uh, really they were because the Romans had been granted the entire world. It's just that those areas hadn't been Romanized yet. So when Valentinian I gets on a boat and when he meets the representatives of uh, the Quadi tribe to come up with a peace treaty to the war they've been fighting in the 350s, the Quadi tell Valentinian to quote-unquote build a fort in their territory. And the Quadi are referring to the territory as theirs, not Roman. And Valentinian becomes so angry at this that he apparently has a brain aneurysm um, and he dies. So with all that said, the last thing I want to cover is this notion of cores and peripheries. So this is a fairly simple concept to grasp, at least in theory. Um, you know, any large territory like an empire is going to have some kind of an imperial center called the core and a zone that is further from that center called the periphery. So sometimes these are actually concrete zones. Like, for example, if we take the Great Plains of the United States, for example, um, and we have this as the core, then the coasts are the peripheries. It's not an exact example, but you get the point. And those peripheries are 100% American, but sometimes the periphery is a fluid concept. And in late antiquity, that core, which used to be the Mediterranean, it flips because the emperors make the frontier zone out here, as a Gaul, Britain, etc., they make that area their headquarters to deal with threats from beyond the frontier. And going with them were all the trappings of the Roman state. Um, so from one perspective, the late antique periphery becomes the late antique core. Now, there's been a tendency to see this flip as part of a process of what's called frontierification of the Roman state. That is to say, the frontier culture bled deeper into what would be the hearts of Roman Gaul um, and Roman Italy. However, many medievalists have recently argued that the opposite is the case. The increasing political and economic complexity of the barbarian tribes is a result of the Roman economic zone extending in the opposite direction, northwards from the Roman cores and peripheries into Central and Eastern Europe. Understanding all of this is crucial to comprehending how and why the Roman state responds in the manner that it does to the problems faced in late antiquity, but the nature of those problems and the barbarian threat is a topic for another time. So as always, guys, I hope you enjoyed this talk, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.